Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Sana from Institute for Advanced Study. So when the Langlands paper came out, beyond the endoscopy, Sana wrote a letter to Langlands saying that the program is too rosy. So, <laughs> so I wonder his uh, mind is changed. So I'm looking forward to this talk. <laughs> so his uh, title is Some Applications of Trace Formula Before and Beyond the Endoscopy. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to celebrate Nagao and uh, this new event that will, I guess, be repeated next year with the next field. I don't know how they plan it exactly, but we'll see. Yeah, so I still don't know how they're planning it. <laughs> I'm helping organize it, yeah. So I'm not La Fogue, and I can't speak French, and I don't know what he was going to say. I vaguely heard uh, my talk, I think, will be on a different aspect. It will be a little related to Nagar's talk. Um, so uh, let me get on with it. Um, one of the things that I want to mention, I will, as I or some recent results on problems which use ideas that are similar to the proof of um, the fundamental lemma. So that's one reason I brought this up, and other aspects of the trace formula. So uh, let me see if I can work this. Good. I prefer to look here. I don't know what you see. So I guess we're working with that one. All right. <laughs> so the... Is the trace formula today is called the Arthur Selberg trace formula, which is apt and correct. And the way Arthur has developed it and the way it's been used with great success is by comparing the trace formula, maybe for two different groups or to compute Shimura varieties. So in the end, it's an issue of comparison. There's no analysis involved. And it's always got two, uh, two sides that you have to prove some basic identity, which can often be extremely difficult. That's where the fundamental lemma and endoscopy comes in. And it's been very successful to prove highly non-trivial cases of functoriality. But as we all know, and that's what this beyond endoscopy uh, talk of Langlands from years ago, uh, he clearly set the limits of what you could do by comparing on, with different groups. And for example, you can't get the symmetric powers that way. And you can't get many interesting cases of functoriality, most, well, pretty much all the interesting cases, except some cases, each hard-earned. Now, you could use the trace formula more directly, and that's what Langlands proposed 10 years ago, and Nagel was explaining some aspect of this, uh, especially in, connected with trying, in connection with trying to understand poles of L functions, which is, I'll review that in a second, and that's what I want to discuss, but in the end, this turns out to be very difficult, so I will even talk about zeros, which are much more difficult, but we a little more modest than what we look for. So that's uh, what this talk's about. Now, the issues, the issues involved, um, I'll uh, skip to one now. Okay, sorry. What happened to... Two, thank you. <laughs> to explain the issues of using the trace formula just as it stands, with two sides to a formula, rather than in the way of com by way of comparison, I need only show you the very first case of the trace formula, the Eichler-Selberg trace formula, and point out a few features in this. And these are the features that just get infinitely more complicated. And it's remarkable that one can use such a formula, as you'll see. But let me explain the points that I think are relevant. So let's take holomorphic forms weight k just for SL2z. This is the eichler selberg the simplest and first case of the trace formula. The trace of the nth Hecker operator on the cusp form, let's say, of weight k is the sum of the eigenvalues. Let's take Hecker eigenforms. So I normalize the eigenvalues as lambda fn times n to the k minus 1 over 2. So it's a sum um, of the Hecker eigenvalues. That's a trace computed by diagonalizing the matrix. And it can also be computed by the orbital integrals or the geometric side, or, which is eminently calculable, and that's why the trace formula is so useful. So the left-hand side is quite mysterious. We know very little about these coefficients. We're trying to infer something about them. And the right-hand side looks 
reasonably explicit here. The number eta is just a complex number that's written over there as a function of m and n. So you have a sum over m between minus root n, 2 root n, plus 2 root n. Everything looks simple here, d to a power, delta is just a function which is 0 if, n, if that number is not an integer and 1 otherwise. But there's one number there that's extremely difficult, and it contains all the difficulty of any aspect of using the trace formula directly, and that's this capital H. That capital H is a Hurwitz class number, and class numbers are not simple functions of the variable d. They are very arithmetical, and they are subtle. And so you might sit, and I'm sure Selberg in the very beginning sat and thought, well, could I prove the Ramanujan conjecture from this formula? After all, I have lambda fn on the left. Can I give an estimate for lambda fn, which would be Ramanujan, in terms of estimating what's on the right? And on the right, you have a sum which has got a lot of cancellation in it. And if h were 1, you could prove anything you wanted, and everything would be very simple. But it's all captured in that arithmetic. And so if you want to use the trace formula uh, directly, as we will see in a second, then uh, you have to face the class numbers, and that's really what uh, this program of Langlands and others is trying to do in the simplest case of GL2 and symmetric powers. So the idea is, uh, as we saw in the last lecture, we might want to use this formula to compute the so S was large, as Nagao explained, and you write down the symmetric power representation of, this, of, of the standard representation of GL2 in this last case, and you have these L functions whose analytic continuation we don't know, except for up to some number that Langland and Shahidi give us, but that ends. It does use, does use exceptional groups, and they're limited in what they can do. So there are different methods, all of which come to an end, and one is trying to open a door here the method might work more. So let's take the symmetric powers. You would take, say, the first power here. So you would try to show that summation lambda fn over n to the s has an analytic continuation, which you know from Hecker. <laughs> but you would try to use the trace formula to prove that, because the trace formula is a very general thing. It converts things you don't know about, these Hecker eigenvalues or Hecker algebra coefficients or Langlands parameters associated with the pi on the left, the mysterious by something explicit. And as it turns out, that's uh, Altag's thesis was mentioned, uh, Altag shows that you can actually take the trace formula, for example, this case here, and you can analytically continue lambda fn over n to the s up to the s equals 1 and slightly to the left and see if it's got a pole and show that that function doesn't have a pole by actually summing this side over n. So it's a double sum. And the hard work, and it's real hard work, is to take these class numbers and analyze them sufficiently accurately analytically. So the trace formula is used critically, and the theorem is not new. It's a case of k equals 1 and 2. This is well known, the case 1. The case k2 was first done by Shimura using theta functions. There are no theta functions in this proof. It's really the trace formula. Now, this, even this approach to this problem, so Langland's beyond endoscopy is an attempt to understand, say, functoriality for high symmetric powers, and the simplest question would be to understand when that has a pole. And, of course, the answer has to be very, very complicated because if you were looking at Galois representations, it could have a pole, and how's that going to come out of class numbers? But... I think one thing Langlands believes very strongly why this is uh, an opening rather than an uh, infinite wall <laughs> is that the only numbers that come here are class numbers of quadratic fields in order to understand all symmetric powers, arbitrary k. The data that you have is only class numbers of quadratic fields. So you sort of feel you it's friendly, you have it in your hands, but that doesn't mean you can execute this. And Altag achieves this in his thesis. And I prevented him from coming to lecture here, not because I wanted to lecture, I've come just for one day, but because he's still writing his thesis and he's under time trouble, and I didn't want him distracted. So if that's okay, I then was convinced by Arthur, well, then you have to come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Venkatesh, in his thesis, achieved the same thing, but by a different method, and I want to point this out. There's another 
formula, which Jacquet calls a trace formula. It's not a trace. There's no trace in it, but they call it the relative trace formula. It's called the Peterson formula in this classical case, or the Kuznetsov formula. It's an expansion, a certain expansion of the kernel before you take the trace, which, again, will have the spectral side, the mysterious stuff, and the right-hand side, some, something like exponential sums. And instead of getting class numbers in that formula, you get Klostermann sums. And Klostermann sums are perhaps friendlier just because so many of us have thought about it for so long. So we sort of know the mechanics of Klostermann sums a lot better than we understand class numbers. In fact, my letter that you mentioned to Langlands explains that if you start with class numbers and manipulate them in a certain way that Altag is doing, uh, you eventually do arrive at Klostermann sums anyway. So it's quite natural in this very simple case to immediately go to the Klostermann sums. And that's what Venkatesh did. He used the Peterson formula, which has weights which are different here, and they're friendlier. And so his proof of the first and second symmetric power by a spectral expansion, let's call it, is much simpler. Altag's achievement is to use the trace formula itself, and it's much more difficult. But the advantage of it is it schematically looks promising. It looks like it's got potential to work more generally, but that looks very difficult over the number field. This is why I asked you over the function field if you, because if you recognize these geometric sums in some very concrete way that you can use something like Hitchin vibrations, that would be great. But in the number field, I don't know. What, uh, I, I, so in my letter to Langlands, I point out some very serious obstacles to do a high symmetric power. As far as I know, they're still there. So <clears throat> this beyond endoscopy, is uh, uh, an avenue we have to pursue if, if we're going to use a trace formula on such a problem. Uh, and it remains a central issue and a very difficult one. So there's this big wall, and we need to try climb it, and people need to find their way around it. Um, that's all I'm going to say about beyond endoscopy here, except uh, what I've said there. Now, if you take the trace formula as written there, and you allow k to vary, that allows you to do much, much more and in great, great generality. And that's what this rest of this talk is about. And in that case, I can look not for poles but for zeros, and I can even be more ambitious and try and understand something like the Riemann hypothesis. So this now will be very speculative at the very end, but in, in the beginning, it's you'll see very concrete, and the use of the trace formula is heavily used here and in general. Okay. So what are the problems I want to discuss? I want to take a general L function, a Langlands L function for an arbitrary group. But just to focus, let me say a word about the standard L function that the Gao mentioned. So according to functoriality, all L functions are L functions on GLN over Q even, corresponding to cusp forms. They are products of those. So these are the building, excuse me, the building blocks of the theory are standard L functions for GLN cusp forms over the rationals even. And I want to study those first in terms of understanding where their zeros are. And, of course, that's a much harder problem than their poles. But we can, we can ask and we can study it using the, potentially using a trace formula. So that's where we go here. And that's uh, the part that's before, endoscopy, before beyond endoscopy. I'll come to the after beyond endoscopy at the very end. So where are the zeros of these kind of functions? And if you took the Riemann zeta function itself, they're supposed to be on the line a half. When I make a computation, I'll clarify to you if I'm assuming Riemann or not, but why don't you just assume it right now? And you ask where are the zeros, and, they, and you go high up, the infinitely many zeros, and you start looking at the distribution of the zeros. Now, Riemann already showed that the zeros get close to each other so between t and t plus 1, the number of zeros is about log t. So if you want to get some signature of what the zeros look like or the distribution of the zeros, rather than the coefficients, which are sato tate type questions, you need to renormalize or you need to space them out so that the, the statistics are looking roughly like the, the zeros. So you unfold them. There's some standard scaling. I'm going to discuss it in another case where it will be absolutely universal. Anyway. Montgomery computed what's called the pair correlation in restricted ranges in the early 70s, and Dyson, on seeing this, made the remarkable insight, seeing the answer that Montgomery had got, 
that this spacing was exactly the spacing in what's called the Gaussian, or I will call it the circular unitary ensemble, that he'd been studying, which is the, this, in connection with random matrix theory and Hamilton, uh, uh, Hamilton, uh, Wigner Dyson theory. In any event, there were some highly non trivial computations in probability there that he had done following Gordon, and, and he was able to compute the n level correlations of matrices. So think of just Haar measure, unitary matrices. Look at the eigenvalues of a random matrix of very large dimension and look at the spacings between the eigenvalues and how they distributed. So this was determined by Gordon and Dyson following him, and they computed all the n-level correlations, and the pair correlation agreed identically with what Montgomery had computed in a restricted range. And that led to what's called the Dyson, Montgomery-Dyson conjecture, that the high zeros obey the statistics of GUE or CUE. And it's something that when I heard of, I could never get out of my mind. Why is that true? And I'm going to try to explain that to you. Because it's saying that the, the, I, the zeros are spectral in their nature. Otherwise, why are they doing this? This is not what would happen if you chose numbers at random. In this connection, Rudnick and myself in the early 90s, in fact, deci we decided let's dismiss this once and for all, <laughs> this idea that the, there's this, that the, the, the zeros are behaving like eigenvalues in this GUE, because we know that, according to Langlands and many, after, many results after that, different pies have their coefficients behave in different ways. They have distributions, which are these H pies you mentioned in your lecture. So the cytotate, there's all sorts of different cytotates if you go to a general L function. And why would the zeros only have one behavior? So we set out to compute the n-level correlations in general, not just the pair correlation, in restricted ranges, Rudnick and myself, with the expectation that we would find different, different answers. But to our shock, we found there's only one answer, and that all L functions high up have only one answer. It's a completely universal feature. It's this GUE, nothing else. So this was a big shock to us that the zeros don't know about the subtleties of the Galois representation they may be coming from. So universally, L functions have this universal behavior, and we computed the n-level correlations in restricted ranges, obtaining this, and numerical experiments, so after Di Montgomery and Dyson, you might not have believed that just based on that little bit that Montgomery had done, there's this tremendous effort by Glitzko in the 80s computing the 10 to the 20th zero and its 70 million neighbors of the Riemann zeta function, and everything fits Beautifully, nothing fit, fitted Dyson's theory of random matrix uh, theory in physics ever so well. So, in fact, exact answers were, were needed where before approximations were always good enough. <coughs> For the zoo of L functions high up, Mike Rubinstein started computing all sorts of different types of GL2 L functions, including mass forms, maybe to see if there was some difference. Indeed, everything is completely universal, and even GL3 automorphic forms have been computed by today. So I think it's fair to say that this is quite reliable. It's very falsifiable by any experiment. And so high up, you don't see anything except this universality. Is it working? No. How about this? Okay. Now, the situation that I want to discuss for the rest of this lecture are families of L functions where there isn't a universal answer, and the big mystery is what is dictating the answer. Why families? It turns out that if you want to understand one L function, our experience in making subconvex estimates or anything non-trivial that's very powerful or bounds towards Riemann is to deform it in a family. Perhaps the most uh, profound case of that is Deline's proof of the Vey conjectures, his first proof. You don't prove the Riemann hypothesis for one smooth projective variety by itself. You deform it in a family. And the monodromy of the family is what allows you to glue these things together and take high symmetric powers and some positivity argument to get the Riemann hypothesis or the Vey conjectures. And in fact, in the theory of global L functions, where we don't know these things, this is still the most powerful method. So we always are deforming in families, but we don't know what a family is in the number field. That's what I'm trying to. 
The most basic family that uh, I want to discuss and return to at the end, because that's where the fundamental lemma analogy will come in, more than an analogy, is just the family of all quadratic L functions or quadratic extensions of the rationals. Is that a family? I want to convince you it is and point out some remarkable things about it. So in this case, I'm looking at all quadratic extensions of Q. Uh, they all got a factor of the Riemann zeta function, so ignore that, because I'm going to look at the zeros near a half. So instead of looking high up where I told you everything is universal, I'm now going to look at a special point, the point where all arithmetic happens with L functions, the central point. And at that point, one can ask, what's the distribution of the lowest zero? Is it hitting one half, or how low is it? Of course, it will get close to a half, so we'll have to scale it in some universal way. There are no parameters in this theory. Actually, Katz and I started this in the 96, 97, after some theorems in the function field that I'll just review very briefly as motivation. But it turns out there was a very beautiful paper of Osluck and Snyder in 93 who made a calculation of the one-level density in a very classical notation. Uh, and uh, part of this lecture, Osluck died, unfortunately, recently, and I gave a, some tribute to him. And so it's a right to mention that that's the first place that low-lying zeros were looked at and something interesting calculated. All right, so I'm going to look at the low-lying zeros, and I'm going to jump ahead and tell you what Katz and I predict from some other setting and which now seems to fit perfectly, is that the low-lying zeros follow a, uh, what, is, what we call a symplectic symmetry. So from the function field, this came out, and then we checked numerically or Rubenstein checked numerically in the number field and theoretically, is if you look at the low-lying zeros, you could model that, and in the function field, the monodromy does exactly that. You could look not at unitary matrices of large size, but look at unitary matrices intersect symplectic, so the, so the maximal compact of the symplectic. So the eigenvalues are still on the circle, and you take half measure on USP 2n or n, n's even, and then you look at the eigenvalue nearest the point 1. The point 1 is, behaves like the point a half, the lowest zero. As n goes to infinity, and you ask, what's the distribution of the, the eigenvalues near 1? And that will be very different if you take different classical groups or different classical symmetric spaces. So there actually are 10 uh, ensembles of random matrices, not 3 as physicists usually think. And we uh, are looking here at this symplectic case, and we use techniques of Godin to compute what those distributions are. And using that, there's an exact prediction, which is the statement that the low-lying zeros in this quadratic family follow uh, a symplectic symmetry. And inf you, uh, we used to call it USB infinity. I'll just call it symplectic symmetry. Let me make precise what that means, because to prove this, I want to point out, and this is where the trace formula is going to come in, so to prove this is a very explicit thing. You want to compute all the n-level correlations, and I'm going to tell you what our conjecture is and what we know about it. So firstly, let me write the zeros as a half plus i gamma j chi. So ls chi is my quadratic L function. I write the zero as a half plus i times the imaginary part. Now, of course, the Riemann hypothesis is a statement that the gammas are real. The theorems that will be proved theoretically will not assume that gamma is real. I'll be summing something over some test function. That test function will actually be, have Fourier transform compact support, so it will be, make sense for all complex numbers. So the actual theorem will be a complete theorem. But to interpret statistically what you're doing, it's best to think of that, of, of Riemann being true. And in applications here, usually you do need to assume Riemann, and to remove Riemann, which you do in many of these cases, you have to argue somewhat differently. I don't want to go into that. So let's assume it here. And... What I was saying is that if you look at a uh, Dirichlet L function, and later automorphic L function in some family, and you look at the lowest zero uh, near half, let's say it's gamma 1 chi d, it will try becoming down close to the point a half. So there's this universal number you multiply the zero the ordinate by, log d over 2 pi. It's always, there's only one recipe. It's log of the analytic conductor, which I'll return to, times uh, divided by 2 pi is the universal scaling, after which you expect, our conjectures, this will follow the eigenvalues of a symplectic scaling limit, which I'm going to tell you what it is. So you form these n-level density sums. So I'm fixing a test function phi to measure the density, which is rapidly decreasing. 
And I sum over all tuples, with J, K distinct, but all N tuples of these zeros, which have been the tildes over there, meaning that in a compact set there should be only finitely many. So this sum over here should actually be stabilizing for a fixed guy. And then I average that over the family. That would be the statement that the zeros are behaving in a certain way. And the answer that you're supposed to get, according to the conjecture of Katz and myself, is that the n-level density will converge to the n-level density of the scaling limit of the symplectic family. And the scaling limit of the symplectic family density is a beautiful n by n determinant. It's given by this function of x, which is you uh, ca calculate that determinant. Um, that's what the kernel is over there. It's k and x, i, x, j. And k, x, y is the, the internal kernel is for the symplectic family is that function over there. Excuse me. So that's your function of n variables, which is the n level density. And the complete story, in other words, if you know all these endpoint correlations, you can compute any other statistic you want. It's like if I ask you to determine a measure. If you know all its moments, you know the measure. This is a more complicated thing because it's got more and more variables. So the whole point process is determined by these determinants. But notice, this is quite a complicated thing, that determinant. And if that's going to come out of the trace formula by some calculation, it's probably going to be a quite serious combinatorial identity. And that has held up things dramatically. Anyway, so Rubinstein checked this, and in his thesis, I insisted that he tr compute this in some range. Now, I didn't say, I, say, I kept on saying words like restricted ranges. These theorems get proved subject to the condition that the support of phi hat is restricted. And the less restricted, the much deeper the theorem. So you really are eager to make the support as big as possible and still have this be true. And he was able to get up to one when he should have been getting up to two. And a student of Sandar Rarajan some years ago was able to get up to two. And he got, but when he got up to two, he was computing from what's well, a variation of the trace formula kind of calculation, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, he got some, for the n level, he got some very complicated expression, which didn't look anything like this n by n determinant, and he couldn't show these were equal. Okay, so I'll return to that at the end. So this was only known for the support less and one where the combinatorics was much simpler. That's the theoretical evidence for our conjecture. There's tremendous numerical evidence that uh, is done by actually computing the zeros. So for this particular family, I, there's absolutely no doubt that the symmetry is symplectic from every point of view. And that uh, uh, explains many computations, early computations by Turing and and uh, I forget his co-worker. I, I forget the guy's name. Uh, okay, sorry. I forget. All right. So this didn't come out of thin air, and I want to explain that because that's what's driving the theory here. So the understanding of the symmetry and the universality of the CUE high up was given in the following way, if you can accept whether it's uh, explanation or not by Katz and myself. And that is we looked at the function field, we replaced the rationals by FQT, and then we looked at all the quadratic extensions of FQT. In this case, the zeta function is a polynomial of degree twice the genus of the curve, the corresponding hyperelliptic curve. And you could ask whether, as the genus goes to infinity, as you go through these quadratic, are the zeros near one after you normalize, the zeros are in a circle. We know the Riemann hypothesis here. And most importantly, we know a spectral interpretation in this case, for curves, it goes back to Schmidt and Weil, but we know it in general, thanks to Groth and Dick. So you could ask whether, as G goes to infinity, you see this symplectic symmetry. Well, this problem happens to be as hard as the number field problem. We don't know anything more about this than the number field. But what Katz and I did was a standard cheat, and that is to take a double limit. We average also over the Q, Q a prime, and in taking first averaging over Q and secondly over the genus. And then we are, uh, have a much bigger family. And then we can use the most important glue there, the monodromy of the various families in the first Q limit, to actually land up with matrices. And then we actually take the techniques of Gordon and compute scaling limits of monodromy to get these universal answers. And in that double limit, we explain everything. So the weakness is it's a double limit. But we do explain that in the bulk, so away from special points, there's only one answer. All L functions, only if you take a typical member of any family, 
in the bulk, it is CUE, completely consistent with that other universality. On the other hand, and this is why I bring this up here, we found that at the point one, there are only four symmetry types. So there's a fourfold way. So of the, all the ten ensembles of Cartan of, of uh, irreducible compact symmetric spaces, which are the random matrix models, the four, they, these are called type two symmetric spaces. They all correspond to groups. These are the only ones that appear in number theory. So these are not to be confused with what you'll see in physics, and this confused us for two years, Katz and myself. This is not to be confused with the COE or GOE, Gaussian symplectic and Gaussian unitary. The only one that's common is a Gaussian unitary. It's common to both. So the, the Gaussian orthogonal has never appeared, as far as we know, in the theory of L functions. So after that, uh, in the function field, there are only four symmetry types, and we don't know... So we, we sort of looked at this quadratic case and many other cases, and many people have worked on many different families, and it seems universal that these four always come up. That seems to be the answer, and that's something that I've been interested in for a long time. So let's go back to Q. The function field is the motivation and leads to very concrete and very falsifiable conjectures. Now, the main problem in Q, which is holding us up and this, I, I, this I just want to make a small progress on, is what is a family? So in the function field, we know what a family of varieties is. There's a base, and as you vary over the base, you have in each fiber some family, and you have a glue, you have a monodromy, which is absolutely critical in understanding each member of the family. In the number field, we do the same thing, but we don't have the notion of a family, and we don't have this glue, but we are still able to do things, and uh, that's what, why this, I think, notion is, is critical. So uh, the, my, since Katz and I did this, I've had a number of students, as you'll see, work on this. But recently there have been developments that I'm quite happy with. Following uh, a few years ago, I decided I, I want to make a definition of a family in the number field. So you can find it there. It gives the recipe of what I mean by the formation of a family of automorphic L functions. I'm going to just tell you roughly how that family is constructed. So there are rules of construction. So this is not a philosophy that is completely falsifiable. I, I give uh, every family fits into this that I know of, and each of these families is uh, either going to fit into those four classes or the basic conjecture of Katz and myself is false. And each of these families, in principle, you can calculate something. So the families are defined in two ways. They are either defined Galois theoretically or using local harmonic analysis. These are a family of automorphic L functions, say, on GLN, but they're some subset defined by some rules. So either they're defined Galois theoretically, maybe you look at all quadratic extensions of Q, or maybe you look at all quintic extensions of Q. Or maybe you give some local, you, if your, your representation pi v on GLN is a tensor product of pi v's, you might locally demand that you are holomorphic at infinity. Or you might locally uh, allow the level to grow, but you put some conditions. So I've given the rules by which one is allowed to form a family from my point of view. So that's that definition. And I call the first harmonic analysis or Galois theory construction. And then, of course, you can make rankin selbergs of those, so they're rules of formation. There's a second family, which is much juicier, but which certainly should be called a family, and that's, but it's very conjectural, is you take a family, a genuine algebraic uh, family of algebraic varieties, say smooth projective varieties defined over Q. For each variety, you look at uh, the L function on some piece of cohomology by standard conjectures of Hess and Vey and Langlands, those are supposed to be L functions, eventually on GLN. So that is a family that even the construction of the automorphic form is assuming all sorts of conjectures. But there are cases, as you know, that have been proven. These are for the representations. Yes, for allylic representations. In a variety. In the family. In the family. But that will eventually give me a family of global automorphic forms defined over Q or over a number field. When you say t varying over the base, what does it mean? Uh, so there's some base. So maybe I'll give you an example in a minute, like all elliptic curves where I might put it in a parameter. Okay. We're doing what? What? It's moving in rationals. Yeah. Yeah, right, rationals. Something like the initial affiliation, whether it's a local family or a global family. 
Okay, I <laughs> haven't thought about it that carefully. I only, to be honest, I only work with examples and, uh, I, okay, I don't want to think that technical point. But I will say something, how you compute <laughs> something with it anyway. <laughs> All right, so these are the two ways of constructing a family. And within that family, I want to study the distribution of the zeros or, or many other problems connected with members of the family. Okay? So I want to I emphasize this point that this theory has no parameters. There's no curve fitting. There's nothing. It's either right or it's wrong. And that's, it's good to, to be in that position. What? No, no, I'm here now, I'm 12. So I'm looking at a family, and we, we're fixing N. I, I have never thought about moving N as well. That's a bit nerve-wracking for me. So we're fixing we are a subset of automorphic cusp forms on GLN, which have been constructed through some rules called the family. Whatever pi is, it's an automorphic cusp form, it has a conductor. Now, this analytic conductor is a very important notion. There's a standard conductor that everybody's familiar with, the place where pi is ramified at the finite places. But in this kind of theory, uh, you also have to allow the Archimedean place to move. So there's an appendage to the conductor which is carefully constructed in terms of the Archimedean parameters of the representation. And it's part of the conductor, and we call that the analytic conductor. And it measures the complexity of an automorphic form. So if you ask, for example, it will tell you the density of zeros near a half. That's why the normalization is universal. It's a log of conductor over 2 pi. There's no games to play here. And you order things always by the conductor unless you can't because it's technically too hard, but you want to order them by conductor. And it's not a trivial theorem that the number of automorphic forms whose conductor is less than x is finite. There should be an asymptotic law there, and I've never been able to prove it because the trace formula of Arthur is not flexible enough in its analytic form yet. That would be a very good test of using the trace formula analytically, which is what we're going to be doing in a minute. Anyway, uh, there should be a vial law, so to speak. The number of automorphic forms whose – this is just like a height. It, it is the complexity of the automorphic form. So for a dirich Lyell function, the conductor is Q if the period is Q. But when you get to a more fancy thing, it's trickier. Now, if you have any hope of computing the low-lying zeros – uh, distribution and you want to show it's equal to what one of those four types, then you have to at least be able to compute the following average, the sum of pi in the, you, of course, uh, your sets have to get bigger because this is an infinite family. So whatever your family is, you're counting all the forms whose conductor is less than x. You better be able to count the number, which is when you restrict is not usually will always be solvable, otherwise you will not be able to do this harder thing, which is to compute the average of the nth coefficient in the series representation of the L function. So this, of course, in the families which are constructed using harmonic analysis is always a trace of some Hecker operator. That's how it's formed. So you can always compute this in principle from the trace formula. And the set is growing, which is why we don't face the harsh difficulties of one looking at one pi, which is what beyond endoscopy is trying to do. So what I'm doing here is I'm relaxing and changing the sets. And so this, at least you have a chance. And that's every case that's computed, which is a, a harmonic analysis defined, or, or, or I'll show you one which is a Galois theoretic defined. You have to do this, and you can do that. In the geometric case, and then this technical issue that was asked will come up, in the geometric family, uh, it's enough to understand how when you move in the family, lambda f, uh, well, for n, by the, Hecker, by the Hecker algebra, you know lambda f at n, lambda pi at n from lambda pi at primes, and the behavior of lambda pi at primes for a geometric family defined over q is exactly the equidistribution theorem of Deline that Katz has uh, made such made friendly for us, and of course is based on this glue, this monodromy, and this theory of growth and in the, in the geometric case, not in the function field, in the geometric family. In a geometric family, let me repeat, the geometric family means I have a, a variety defined over Q with a parameter T which is varying over Q, and I have then a family of L functions on a piece of cohomology, which then by standard conjecture is giving me my automorphic form whose zeros I'm trying to study, the zeros of this global automorphic form. Okay, so for all of these, 
Uh, the basic now conjecture is that you, you have one of these four universality types. There's only one of four answers that can come up for the low-lying zeros in a family. And this has now been checked for many, many families without any. So as I say, we have a definition or a working definition. But basically, it's built out of all the many examples that have been building up over the last 10 years. And in each case, it's the, the symmetry type is checked by computing in restricted ranges, just like the case I showed you before. There's always restrictions on the Fourier transform, phi hat, but one obtains answers, and they always are just one of these four. But predicting which one of the four is something that I want to address in a moment. That I did not know, and I asked that as uh, what, what is the source of this, because that's the glue. So let me give you some examples, recent ones. I don't want to go through all of this. So now I will start talking about beyond, <laughs> after beyond endoscopy, the use of the trace formula. The first example is not actually the trace formula. The theory of semi-simple groups and harmonic analysis in North America was highly influenced, it seems, by Harishandra. There's a theory of pre-homogeneous vector spaces developed in Japan, which turned out to be also very useful, but it didn't surface in this country that much. It, uh, Yuki wrote a lot about it, and uh, Bhargava, a student of ours at Princeton, used it brilliantly to count cubic and quartic, uh, quartic and quintic fields. So you could ask, just like we asked at the beginning about quadratic fields, that it, everybody knows how to count quadratic fields. <laughs> Suppose you count cubic fields. So let's look at all cubic fields ordered by the conductor discriminant. Do the low-lying zeros obey one, that, one of those rules? So I'm telling you that if you want to look at the low-lying zeros, it's much harder than just counting the number, but you better be able to count the number first, otherwise you uh, have a cheek to try count th this thing. And that's something we can do. So this is Heilbronn and Davenport counted the number of cubic fields less than x asymptotically. And Cortic and Quintic is the recent work of Bhargava in his thesis. And using that and much more and quantitative versions of that, uh, Yang, a recent student of mine, was able to compute. He hasn't done five because that's a hard pre-homogeneous pre vector space. But he's done the case of three and four. And they're also symplectic. So the low-lying zeros, he computes the one and two level density, follow the rule that's symplectic. So you're supposed to be guessing what the answer is. <laughs> is it symplectic orthogonal? All right, so there's a symplectic family. This doesn't use a trace formula. The mechanism that you're using to do the counting is pre-homogeneous vector spaces. So the, the, the reason you can do qu uh, cubic, quartic, and quintic is those correspond to pre-homogeneous vector spaces. And the, four, the degree four, actually, if you look, is in the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. It shows you how to solve a cortic using a pre-homogeneous vector space. Never mind. So it's not new. <laughs> Here's a geometric family, okay? Lamont. Hello. Here's a geometric family. <laughs> I'll take the naive family of elliptic curves. A and B are rational. I'll order them by naive height. Now, there's an issue here. I said you must order by conductor. And the relation between the height in terms of discriminant and the conductor is a well-known problem, closely connected to ABC, um, which is much easier to handle, yeah, because you're averaging. You don't need to know what's the most extreme case. In any event, all the people working on this cheat. They all work with naive height, and they cheat with the conductor just because they don't want to face this content, this issue of what's the content of a discriminant. But it doesn't change the answer. The low-lying zeros of the family of elliptic, universal family of elliptic curves is orthogonal to every, and numerically perfect. Everything fits the, that this is an orthogonal case. The low-lying zeros follow the orthogonal symmetry. This was started by Brummer. Heath Brown wrote a paper. S.J. Miller's thesis numerically experiments this great depth. Matthew Young has the biggest support and the big support has quite spectacular applications to ranks of elliptic curves and things like that, where the low-lying zeros are of great interest. Yeah, so there's a refinement. Okay, I make four families, and you should always be able to take your orthogonal and break it into even an odd if the functional equation happens to be jumping. Uh, so that's controlled by another invariant, which is quite tricky, the, the root number. 
And usually you can break that up further, but that's further expense. The support will collapse further. <laughs> Each time you put a condition, these, the technicalities of computing these things using the trace formula. In this case, uh, you, of course, this is a geometric family, so you're averaging all elliptic curves. Uh, the earliest paper on this does not use, you don't have to use anything fancy in this family. It's an old paper of Birch. How the number of points on an elliptic curve varies over FP. But if you took a one parameter family of elliptic curves, then you should use uh, the, the correct machinery. All right, so now I come to the two papers that uh, made me give this lecture. And uh, I made this definition a few years ago in the hope that somebody would try to look at a general family and use the trace formula. Because all the cases we've done with GL2, we're using these Kuznetsov formulas. We're using all the tools that we are very familiar with, and we're getting very far in those cases. But the trace formula, when it comes to an arbitrary group, is something that's very hard to use analytically. It's, very, it's been successfully used in the terms of comparison, but if you actually want to count one side of the formula, vary one side of the formula, the formula is so complicated that uh, until, what, 10 years ago, you didn't even know you could take the trace. You didn't know it was trace class. So you had to collect terms on the one side and keep them together because of convergence issues. But that has changed. I mean, Lapid and Mueller have cleaned, cleaned this up, I think. And so there are potential applications that they were working on, but this came first, and it's very beautiful. So this is work of Shin Templier. Uh, Shin is here. And uh, it's as follows. So they look at one of the, fa uh, the kind of family that I was describing as a harmonic analysis family, but they look at it in complete generality, and that's both the price to actually execute the averages is therefore very difficult. It's not just a matter of computing those limits, but actually you need to control remainders, and that's quite difficult in this case. In any event, this is what they get. You take a reductive, any reductive algebraic group defined over Q. You look at its dual group, its full dual group, not just the connected component of that entity, and any representation of the dual group into M by M matrices. So remember, that's the setting in which Langlands defines an L function. Now, maybe we don't know these L functions are good for all these examples, but in the ones that we do, that's where you would apply this. This is, of course, necessary in order to use the technique, which I haven't explained, of how you go from the zeros, uh, from, from that average to the zeros. I, I won't go through that. Let me state the theorem. So in order to make a family here and... They don't want to face, I think, the continuous spectrum, because most people don't like looking at that except me. <laughs> uh, they look at what are my very natural family, and those are the ones, the analog of the holomorphic forms in our path plane, that is discrete series. So they'll assume that the real group has discrete series in the first place, and then they'll allow the discrete series to have weight which is increasing, and the family will be defined either by increasing the weight, at infinity we're fixing it to be discrete series, but we can vary, we could fix the weight, we could fix that discrete series if it's regular enough, and let the level grow, or we could uh, fix a level and let the weight grow, or you could do them both simultaneously. Anyway, that's a very good family, that's exactly one of the families defined by harmonic analysis. So, the, And then we have the L functions, uh, and we are asking what are the low-lying zeros behaving like and which symmetry type do they, do they follow one of those four? And the answer is yes. So they look at this Langlands L function. They're going through all those pies which are generic in the sense that they, the weight is increasing of the level. And so far they've only computed the one level density, but they would be, I'm sure can do the N level and I'm sure it will be consistent throughout, but that hasn't been checked because it's already uh, uh, over 100 pages, this paper. They compute the one level density and find that the answer is they haven't, they haven't broken up the orthogonal into, with the root number. It would be more work. So they only have three answers potentially at this point. And they get one of those three. And the beautiful answer is that here, in terms of Langland's data, is the dictation of the answer. And this is what I really like. It's a first time. It's a sufficiently general family to actually start to guess what the symmetry is as a function of the formation of the L function. So there's something called the Sure Index, which just looks for your represent. So if the representation of the Langlands dual group, which is an M-dimensional representation, it's either got no, it's not self-dual. If it is self-dual, then it's either got a 
it preserves a it preserves a bilinear pairing which is either alternating or symmetric and the show index measures these three possibilities and it turns out the opposite that if the row has an invariant symmetric pairing then the symmetry type that they find on using the trace formula is symplectic it switches that comes from the calculation I mean, they don't have a spectral interpretation of the zero, so they're not explaining it as eigenvalues of a matrix. But they are giving a rule, and that rule uh, is consistent with every case that we know that has been computed. I haven't checked the geometric families, but all the harmonic analysis families or Galois families, which are consistent with uh, having a representation of, of the dual group GL. So to me, this is a very beautiful that there's such a clean answer in this case for the symmetry type, which is something that uh, I had wondered about for some time in this generality. It does yeah. for any row. No, no. If it's defined, but if it's not defined, you assume it's analytic, and the proof will, will give the answer. In other words, okay, I haven't explained the method of proof. Just let me finish my lecture, and then maybe I'll, I've still got five minutes. And I might explain that point. So this is a theorem in the case that we do know that the L function, we do know some, in the cases that we would know functoriality for that row. So that we do land up with, with L functions which are got the right analytic continuation functional equation. So any, that's all you need. You don't have to go to GLN. You just need to know the L function is got the right properties. Now I want to point out another thing which I find very interesting, and that's a work of uh, Et Enten. This was just posted a few weeks ago. Roditi and Rudnik. And I mentioned that for the quadratic family, the simplest family, the very first family, there was this doubling of the range that nobody could prove that the answer was it was supposed to be, even though you could analytically execute the answer. It's just the answer for the n by n case was supposed to be an n by n determinant. And the answer that you get is a some sum of n factorial terms which you can't match directly with the, some expansion that you might know of this determinant. So, they had, people had checked it for n equals 2, 3, and 4, but this remained a very difficult combinatorial identity that they couldn't prove. And philosophically, this is very much like the fundamental lemma. What they had the idea is, well, let's make the same computation in the function field, the exact same computation. So they fix P large, and they take FPT, and they look at all the quadratic extensions. They use the technique that I'm suppressing, of computing the density of low-lying zeros by some trace formula. In this case, it's GL1, so it's just ordinary harmonic analysis sums. You compute the low-lying zeros, and you get an answer for the function field, which, uh, in terms of a formula of the combinatorics, the leading term, is identical to the number field. The identity you need to prove in the end is a purely horrible combinatorial identity, but it's the same in the function field and the number field. So they have, and then they just check uniformity. They could average over P. They average over P. And then they can use my theorem with cats, which tells you the answer is correct. And so in this way, you prove the number field case by proving an identity in the function field. Might be, might remind you of something. Uh, so the question is quite philosophical. What, uh, there's all these analogies between function fields and number fields. But here's a case, like the fundamental lemma, what's unusual to me, and I may be wrong, I didn't know other, any other case other than the fundamental lemma where you take the function field and the number field, and it's not that you have an analogy, that you're proving something and model's true here and model's true there. In the model case, you have an analogy, then you have to invent the same techniques. In the proof of the fundamental lemma, the proof in the number field it uses the proof in the function field because you're proving a complicated combinatorial identity about orbital integrals. And that identity can be proved in any setting. This is even a logical theorem, as you know, from Hales and his co-workers. And it's similar here. So this identity, these identities for these n-level correlations turn out to be very difficult to prove. They're purely combinatorial. Maybe somebody much better at combinatorics would have proved this easily. But we couldn't do it. But luckily, the function field saves you by exactly the same mechanism. So these are the only two cases where I know this analogy is in the form of you use the function field to prove an identity in the number field and hence deduce the number field, which is something you really want in the number field. And maybe you weren't so interested in the function field. 
Okay, I don't want to, I want to just go into a philosophical end, uh, but I should say that the notion of families here for the global L functions averaged in this way and variance of it is critical in proving both condition, uh, conditionally, so if you assume Riemann, then you get much better results, but many of the unconditional theorems like subconvexity are all proved by deforming in families and averaging with the trace formula. In other words, you are learning about individual L functions by trying to find a small family to move it in. And then you don't have the glue. We don't have this monodromy, but we are able to use the calculations through the trace formula to substitute for it. This is not a coincidence. I mean, uh, the reason uh, my understanding from Deline is what he did, which Groth and Dick was not familiar with, was exactly rankin selberg which is the first second moment which gives a non-trivial estimate, a partial approximation towards Ramanujan, which in the function field, the lean understood you could use the, uh, growth and Dick's work to get arbitrary symmetric powers and hence conclude the whole of Vase conjectures. So in the number field, we stuck with very few limited calculations, and that's how we get approximations to things like subconvexity. So this is part, the, the families is part and parcel of the situation, but we don't have the glue. Now that the symmetry type seems to be falling into place, at least it's fallen into place in that family that it's related to the uh, nature of the representation of the Langlands dual group, one can wonder what is the real reason. And I have no doubt that the real reason that the, the, this, uh, say, the quadratic family is following the symplectic rule is because there's obviously a spe spectral interpretation of the zeros, and in that spectral interpretation, there's a non-trivial bilinear form, which is alternating, which is preserved. It's nothing unitary yet. It's none of this, okay, if I may speculate for a second, it's got nothing to do with unitarity in this Riemann Hilbert dream of putting zeros on a line. This is nonsense. This has never, ever proved any Riemann hypothesis in the function field. It's not proved that way. But the symmetry, the monodromy symmetry, is what's being reflected here. The way you put things on a line is through families. It's the only general tool we have, and that's the only thing that's worked. So I'm only talking about success. In the number field, we, of course, don't have this. So I did spend some time a few years ago to go look at all the spectral interpretations that people have cooked up to see if the symmetry is there. Now, the best spectral interpretation is the theory of Eisenstein series. The best proof that we know, the deepest thing we know about non-vanishing on L functions on the line one comes from what's called the Maas-Selberg relation, a positivity argument which lies deeper in our present understanding than the method of Adamant and the Lavalier-Poisson, which is the standard method that everybody uses. In other words, there are L functions for which, say, the Langland-Shahidi method works, and you can prove the function doesn't vanish on the line one and even give zero free regions. So this was done by Lapid, um, Gelbart, and myself. You can even give zero free regions by that method, which cannot be touched by other methods because the Euler product doesn't even converge, as far as we know, up to the line one. So there is a spectral method that actually happens to be the most powerful thing we know towards Riemann, so to speak. But looking there, I couldn't find the symmetry. So I looked around, and I looked at Kahn's interpretation. Now, in Kahn's interpretation, I don't know if you've looked at it, but you can, I have a letter to Bombieri explaining what it is. I assume Riemann for simplicity. For this quadratic family, there's no glue. That's the missing thing. But you could look at each guy and see if you could put a bilinear pairing to see a symplectic bilinear pairing in his interpretation, which is the action of the ideal class group on A over Q star, A over Q star, it's a very singular thing. His interpretation assumes Riemann, but there's a paper of Meyer which actually shows that there's nothing to do with Riemann. You can give a proper spectral interpretation that way. It's in the Duke Math Journal. Anyway, I haven't checked this. If you assume Riemann, I explain how you can give a symplectic pairing. So there's something good about his interpretation that I found this non-degenerate bilinear form, and I wrote it down, which is each, each individual guy preserves, and it and it's consistent. But whether it's powerful enough to do anything, I don't know. The glue is there. All right, I'll stop. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't answer one question, because you worried about what is a theorem and what's not. You should always be worried. So suppose I take an L function, which is supposed to be a, have an analytic continuation functional equation. If it does, the following will be true, and otherwise it still can be done, this calculation. So the formula which relates zeros 
to uh, the zeros of the function to the uh, coefficients is called the guinand ve explicit formula. It's a, like a trace formula. In fact, everybody has always looked at this and said this, that's what Weyer was trying always to do, was to give an interpretation of his explicit formula as a trace of something. But anyway, it's in a formula that's provable by just complex analysis. On the one hand, you have the sum over the zeros you know, of a test function, and on the other side, you have the sum of the Fourier transform summed over the primes and prime powers with the coefficients lambda, F, lambda pi p. So in this case, you have this identity, and then you average this identity over the pi's using a trace formula, and you get this low-lying zeros if the function were analytic. So you can do it even without knowing that and check the answer, but to actually say it is the answer that, you, that you're really computing the zeros, you need to know that this explicit formula used that there's a functional equation. So in a way, you can do the computation without knowing that. That's all I'm saying. So in their paper, am I correct? You just assume functoriality, right? Is that correct? Yeah. But he, 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 the calculation, cons the consistency is, is definitely there. But the trace formula comes exactly when you average. So the only difference between this and beyond endoscopy, since I think that's what you want to the lecture, <laughs> is there you want to look at one pi at a time. You want to know, does pi have a pole? And a pole is a hard question, and a zero is a harder question. But what I'm saying to you is, in this game, you let the family grow, and then these complicated class numbers can be handled in great generality for, for reasons that, uh, because you're letting it grow. Okay, any other questions? I, I'd like to yeah. another example. Oh, yes? The function field is used to prove the number field. Don't tell me it's Andre Vey's notion of an A, what does he call it? No, no, oh, an A field or something. Yeah. Of course. The first proofs of the, uh, of the local language index yeah, depended on, on NAR's uh, numerical uh, correspondence, and that was proved first. In the function field? No. In the last a few years ago. Uh, and then you transferred that to the number field? You need to be able to prove a number of things. Uh, now, no, a few years ago, Peter Schultz has found another proof, so it's, it's no longer. Okay. I'm quite interested in that. If you ever find how you transform from the function field to the number field, the Riemann hypothesis, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so I claim identities you can move over, but I think it's inequalities is what we're lacking. And that's, in a sense, what uh, maybe Mochi Zuki might be doing. Yeah, he's, he's, he's moving. In, if he's doing anything, it's inequalities yeah. over different fields. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite understand how you. Uh, I didn't quite understand how you describe uh, the uh, orthogonal um, distributions that you get. So you have a representation of the dual group to give you L functions. So in in their theorem, in Shin's theorem, yes. right? Right. So you have G. You have a representation of the dual group into GLM, and this representation is either not self-dual, and if it is self-dual, it's either orthogonally or symplectically self-dual. Uh -huh. If it's symplectically self-dual, the low-lying zeros are orthogonally distributed by the oh, general... That the, depends on the root number. Like no. Oh. No, it's not about the root number. <laughs> now, if you want to break the orthogonal into a finer thing, you can start looking at the root number. But, yeah, I have been accused of this before, and I'm quite sensitive to this. Uh, <laughs> it is not about the root number dictating the symmetry. That's what's so interesting. What's dictating the symmetry is the sure index. And the root number, so I can give you orthogonal families, which are even orthogonal. All the guys are even fu functional equation. Symplectic always is even. And these two guys are all got root number one. And this guy's orthogonal, and this guy's symplectic. I can give you many such examples. So the, the, the symmetry type is not dictated by the root number alone. Okay, that's all. So when you use more information? If you're orthogonal, like in that, okay. So if you can analyze it further, take the family of all uh, elliptic curves. All right, so the elliptic curves now, the, you, now the, the, the sign of a functional equation for an elliptic curve is like the Mobius function of of the conductor, the subtle function. So you could ask, could you average Mobius over the discriminants? This, uh, so this has been done by Healthcourt using techniques of uh, Ivanich and uh, Friedlander. So you, but you can, 
And then you can break the orthogonal into even and odd. And then the even guys have, so the even orthogonal has its own distribution, and the odd orthogonal has, okay, uh, 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 we, we teach the following theorem, that a matrix in odd dimensions, which is SO, the even and odd goes with SO, not with O. So as you know, if you have a special orthogonal matrix in odd dimensions, it's always got an eigenvalue, one. And that guy is there permanently, and then the low-lying zero, that distribution, is the next guy. And Katz and I explained that, that, that. We compute that distribution. So I'm just saying there's a refinement of the orthogonal if you can do the tricky analysis of breaking your family with a root number. But there are families where the root number is, as I say, an orthogonal family for which a root number is one all the time. There's no minus one to be seen. And, then that, and that guy's not symplectic, so it shows that the, the symmetry type is more subtle. I mean, the symmetry type's connected with what the, what the alternating form the matrix is preserving. But So maybe this con view can at least at this formal level be checked on geo, for all families. That would be interesting. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker.